Hello and welcome to the AOCS Pitch Competition. I'm Alan Payne, the current Vice Chair of the Processing Division at the AOCS, and I've been a member of the association since 2017, although, as I said before, I've been lurking on the sidelines for a lot longer. Congratulations to our e-poster finalists who've been chosen by a panel of judges for today's pitch presenters. We will introduce our presenters in a moment, but first we want to acknowledge our volunteer judges. First, I'd like to welcome Rinat Ran Ressler, the current Vice Chair of Health and Nutrition Division. Dr. Ran Ressler is a principal scientist with the Nestle Health Service. We also have Professor Ignacio Vietes, the current Chair of Health and Nutrition Division and a research professor at the Universidad de la, de la Republica in Montevideo, Uruguay. Representing our processing division, we have Dr. Peter Reimers and Mr. Joe Sherelli, both of Aristine Systems. Aristine is a provider of retrofit equipment and value creating services for fuel, ethanol and biodiesel producers. So here's what's gonna to happen today. Each student will present for up to five minutes. After each student presents, there'll be a seven minute question and answer session. And our live streaming audience may post any questions or comments or congratulatory notes or anything else for that matter, so long as it's decent. And we'll try and address as many questions as possible during the seven minute limit. Then after the presentations have ended, we'll pause the stream for a few minutes to allow our, for our final judging deliberations. During this time, the audience will be able to vote for their favorite pitch. And uh, it, it really does matter here because there are prizes. So um, if you don't vote, then your favorite person won't get a prize. Lastly, we'll announce the first and second place winners of the student pitch competition for group one and the winner of the audience vote. So it's time to begin. Our first presenter. The first presenter is Arda Tuhanioglu, a graduate student at the University of Arkansas in the Department of Food Science. He will present on the topic of his e-poster, Selective Extraction of Triacylglycerols from a Corn Sorghum-Based Bioethanol Production Side Stream to Purify High Melting Point Waxes. Thank you, Arda. Okay, thank you. And hello, everyone. I am Arda, and I welcome you. Uh, with a bioethanol production schematic because the project is about fractionation of lipids from corn sorghum based bioethanol production side streams using supercritical carbon dioxide technology. The title sounds a bit complex, but everything is, is going to make sense in five minutes. You have my word. So first I want to introduce the raw material, which is the side stream and where it comes from. So the story begins at the fermentation stage. After ethanol is produced by fermentation, it's purified by distillation and the pure ethanol leaves the frame and we are only left with the waste to treat. So we treat the waste by centrifugation to fractionate it into solids and liquids and the liquid waste is further condensed in an evaporator and then stored in a syrup tank. But this is not the syrup that you think it is. This is the famous size stream which is a complex lipid containing triacylglycerols, free fatty acids, wax esters, and several waxy compounds. Well, this is a potent source for oils and waxes that can be used in food, cosmetics, and all the other industries. But um, for the industries, the size stream is in such complex form. So there's need to develop a novel sustainable fractionation method. And we developed 
a fractionation method with supercritical carbon dioxide technology. That's another technical term. What a supercritical technology is? Well, from my perspective, it's a very useful and important technology with a lot of applications, but it is lack of recognition. So let me help you understand what supercritical CO2 is. In the simplest terms, supercritical is just a physical state between liquid and gas. How is that possible? Let me help you with a simple phase diagram of CO2. And I promise it's not gonna be one of those agonizing thermodynamics courses. That's not what we are here for. I'm just gonna, I just wanna let you know to get a good grasp of this technology. So let's say we have CO2 gas molecules floating freely and independently. What happens if you increase the pressure on a gas? It becomes liquid, just like how you brew your espresso. Same principle. However, this is only possible below the critical temperature. If you increase the temperature above the critical limits and then pressurize it, it does not liquefy anymore. It becomes supercritical. Therefore, at the supercritical state, carbon dioxide is as diffusive as a gas and as dense as dissolvative as a liquid, which makes it which makes it an ideal, ideal solvent for our cause. And we implemented this technology to split the bioethanol side stream lipids into its oil and wax fractions. It is non-toxic, environmentally friendly, it's inexpensive, abundant, and it has mild critical temperature and pressure. This is specifically important because for the reference, if you wish to get a supercritical water, for example, you need to go all the way up to 400 degrees Celsius, which is a lot of energy. And the results, did we succeed? I'm gonna show you an old school before, after videos, and I'm gonna let you decide on, on that. Oops, sorry about that. This is the crude slurry, the form we received from the bioethanol industry. It's unprocessed, very thick, viscous, and bulky. And after the supercritical CO2 fractionation, this is the end product we get. Now it's smooth, clear, and fluent, and it smells like a regular oil from grocery store. And a little bit of scientific data. This is a melting point analysis diagram. This is a simple uh, differential scanning calorimetry diagram. Each peak here represents a melting point, and multiple peaks with, with the crude slurry infers that the oil is very complex with multiple melting points. And on the other hand, the extracted oil has only a single melting point at 17 degrees Celsius, which makes it liquid at room temperature. Okay, but this is the oil fraction. What happened to the other compounds? They are right here. As expected, the second fraction is high purity wax with high melting points. And there you have, you are free to choose whichever fraction works best for your application. For your information, we statistically modeled and optimized this procedure using response surface, surface methodology for the future industrial use. But I'm, I'm not here to share the, the boring mathematical details. But the, the bottom line is the model is gonna be tested on a high scale in an industrial facility pretty soon. Thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, Shada. That was uh, very interesting. It's always been a bit of a puzzle to me how uh, supercritical carbon dioxide works. It seems a paradox. It's not quite a liquid. It's not quite a gas. And that, uh, yeah, 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 we can have to understand it somehow. Uh, now it's time for the judges' um, f uh, feedback and questions. Uh, if you're in the audience, please add any questions in the chat and we'll just wait a little moment and, and see if there are any, um, any coming up.
Well, perhaps, uh, perhaps I'll, I'll chip something in while we're waiting. You know, this um, this oil and wax. So, uh, what range of sort of commercial um, commercial um, applications do you think you you might have? For example, there is a rising demand on alternative waxes. Uh, you know, the commercial waxes are especially in food and cosmetic industry. It's uh, it's called carnauba wax with around 80, 81 degrees Celsius of melting point, which is ideal for multiple, uh, a lot of compounds. But I think because of some demand and supply issues, there's a really rising demand, especially I am getting a lot of questions about waxes uh, other than the oil fraction. So I think this would be a nice alternative for food coatings. And I don't know much about cosmetics, but I believe it can be useful for cosmetics too. And for the oil part, I believe the most useful area would be biodiesel, since I have, I've seen a lot of research on the size streams and how to purify it for biodiesel usages. But since it's out of my expertise area, I cannot give you much detail about it. Okay, well, we'll move on to the uh, judges' questions. Uh, does anyone want to start? Maybe Ignacio, would you like to um, have you got something you'd like to say? Okay, uh, Arda, uh, first of all, first of all, uh, congratulations for your study and your presentation. It was very clear. Uh, my question is: uh, What do you think uh, about the perspective of the supercritical extraction technology for? at uh, industrial application, what, what do you think about that? Okay, um, I think uh, supercritical CO2 application is gonna be, is gonna be, is gonna get larger and larger because we, uh, since the environmental awareness of public rises. So now everyone is worried about the toxic solvents we're, use, we're using on lipid extractions like hexane, heptane, or uh, this kind of toxic and environmentally hostile, hostile uh, chemicals, CO2, I think is a cleaner option for that. For the reference, nowadays 95% of coffees, it's not lipid, but the decaffeination process, more than 95% of the decaffeination at the industry is switched to supercritical carbon dioxide since it is more environmental friendly and it treats the sample, it, it treats whatever the sample you have mildly and gently. So therefore uh, the CO2 is going to make the production's cleaner and uh, the end products more appealing and purer. Thank you very much. Okay, Rina, did you yeah, want to I can, um, have the question? Yeah, I can go next. So, so my, my interest is in nutrition, and I'm wondering if the wax esters uh, are, will be or are food grade, and if so, can they be used for encapsulation? And then a follow up question if so, if you know anything or any speculation on if they will be digested or how they will behave in the in the gastrointestinal tract. Um, I am well, thank you for your question, first of all. And I am just getting started the advanced characterization of what I uh, with uh, GC, MS, and FID studies. Mm -hmm. uh, from what I can see now, it is really 90 to 95%, maybe more than 95% of triacid glycerols, just like what we get from olive oil and some free fatty acids. From health pers perspective, my concern is the free fatty acid content is a bit high, but other than that, what I see the rest looks like food grade, but nutrition is whole another profession. So I refrain from health claims. It's a very delicate, uh, very slippery area. And with the wax esters, I think I have, we extract plenty of different wax esters in chemical terms, for example, uh, aldehyde dimers that we cannot get from other wax sources. This is thanks to sorghum, uh, unique sorghum wax. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, it is possible to use them for encapsulations because those are very, very long uh, wax chains. I believe it's around more than 50 plus uh, carbon chain length. So I see a future, but we'll see. I'm just getting started for the characterization. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. Excellent talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Joe and Peter, did you have anything you'd like to add to that? No, um, uh, I, I do. 
Oh, yes, Joe. No, I just wanted to say, Arda, I think you did a fantastic job. Um, when talking about um, supercritical CO2, though, what's the cost to scale this type of, of an operation, especially with the volumes you're talking about? Okay, the this, is, this is, you asked the critical question for critical CO2. Thank you so much. So the main problem, if you check out, so I got curious when I first figured out how clean this technology is, and I checked on why the industry is still working with hexane, and I realized that the installation cost demands a lot of money. That's the main problem. That's why we need to convince the companies to somehow switch to this technology. But once it is set, once the installation cost is dealt with, the operation cost uh, is going to break even. That's for sure. Otherwise, I believe the uh, caffeine purification and the coffee companies wouldn't have chosen this technology as, the, uh, as their main procedure. But you are right. The cost is the main problem with this technology, especially installation costs, not operation costs. Excellent. I appreciate uh, your presentation, Arda. Thank you very much. Thank you for your questions. Did you want to add anything, Peter? Or as everyone said, uh, it... my question is um, cost as well. But the other is uh, gene modification. Since uh, corn going to ethanol is a non-food um, product. Question is if the waxes um, are then uh, food grade or even be usable in, in cosmetics. From now, what I can see, the chemically speaking, like chemical wise, they do look promising, but the food grade thing, so it has to be investigated and optimized, maybe only to fractionate uh, the food grade compounds, but are they food grade now? I cannot give you a clear information, unfortunately, but that that what that that's the aim. We are trying to recover everything we can in food and cosmetic uh, applications. Well, we have to move on to the next uh, presenter, but there's just one small question in from coming from the audience. Um, is there anything left after you spit the syrup from the wax? So, okay, you've got the you've now got the oil, you've got the wax. What's left over? Very very quickly, please. Actually, nothing. So oh. the, the moisture content is very low. So as I treat, as I infuse the CO2 into it, I collect the wax, uh, I collect the uh, triacylglycerols and free fatty acid fractions, fractions in a while. And whatever's left uh, in the extraction vessel is wax. So everything I collected, I just showed you. There's nothing else. Oh, and excellent. of course, there is a protein fraction in it too, but it is not dissolved. It's prop the protein fraction is probably still in the uh, wax fraction because they are not they cannot be dissolved with carbon dioxide. But the fraction is very very low. Ninety nine percent is lipid. Okay, well, th thanks very much. I, I sort of imagine there'd be something left over, but um, that that's useful to know. So um, the next presenter is going to be. Um, Our next presenter is Emerson Nolasco, a graduate student at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. His presentation is on a comparison study of egg enrichment in efficiency and the bioaccessibility of bioactive compounds on farm fresh and commercial eggs. Take it away, Emerson. Thank you, Alan, for your kind introduction. So let's talk about the egg. The egg is an excellent vehicle for dietary compounds such as carotenoids and polyunsaturated fatty acids. These compounds are incorporated into the egg through the diet of the laying hens, and therefore we have enriched eggs. Once in the eggs, these lipophilic nutrients, along with peptides and amino acids, 
have shown to have a higher bioaccessibility compared to their plant sources of the same compounds. And that is important because bioaccessibility is the amount of the compound that can be absorbed in our body. Once these compounds are in our body, they can help to reduce the progression of diseases such as macular degeneration and cardiovascular diseases such as atherosclerosis and hypertension. Previous studies have shown the effect on, of one or two factors on the storage stability and bioaccessibility of the enriched compounds. And usually these studies have been done on farm-derived eggs, so they take the eggs directly from where the hens are laying them. But the reality is a little bit more complex. And there is an interaction between all these factors, such as shell color, the diet, the storage, and the cooking, on the bioaccessibility of the enriched compounds. So therefore, we need a holistic approach that can evaluate the combined effect of all these factors. And as well, we need this approach to differentiate if there is a difference between the bioaccessibility of farm-derived eggs and commercial eggs, which consumers take from the supermarket or commercial stores. To answer these questions, we took standard and enriched white shell and brown shell eggs from a farm and from commercial supermarkets in Lincoln, Nebraska. The eggs were either fried or boiled and subjected to a simulated gastrointestinal digestion to evaluate the bioaccessibility in which we use pepsin in the gastric phase and pancreatin in the intestinal phase. From here onwards, I'm only going to show the data on cooked eggs and digested eggs because the raw eggs were out of the scope of the study and in the interest of time, I'm only going to present the data that was significantly different. So we start with degree of hydrolysis, which is an indirect measurement of the digestibility of the egg protein. And here we observed that farm-derived eggs had a higher digestibility compared to commercial eggs. Also, we evaluated the peptide content after the digestion, and we found out that for commercial brown shell and rich eggs, a higher peptide content was observed when they were boiled compared to the frying counterpart. Later, we analyzed the carotenoid content through HPLC, specifically for lutein. And here we observed that even though the farm derived and rich eggs had a higher content of carotenoids, after digestion, only the brown fried eggs had a higher lutein content, while the commercial eggs didn't have a higher con uh, lutein content compared to their standard counterparts. Finally, we evaluated the polyunsaturated fatty acid through G uh, grass chromatography, and we found out that farm-derived white shell boiled eggs had a higher content of linolenic acid, and for the cosaxanoic acid, all the enriched eggs, uh, such as white shell and brown shell, had a higher content of this Cosaxanoic fatty acid, except for brown shell boiled and white shell digested eggs. This study is important because it can help the egg industry in optimizing and rich egg commercialization practices to deliver bioactic compounds and educate the consumer to make informed decisions about the preparation of their eggs to obtain maximum health benefit. Thank you very much for your attention. And that was very interesting. I, I remember a debate years ago in the UK about whether brown and white eggs were uh, either better for each better than each other, uh, and um, a lot of people said, "Well, there's no difference at all." But in the UK today, you can only buy brown eggs. And when I lived in the United States, I only saw white eggs. I never saw a brown egg all the time I lived in the United States. But that's mm. so. That's a, an interesting comparison. Right. It's time for the judges to give any any feedback and questions. And if you're in the audience, uh, please add your questions into the chat. 
So uh, who's who's ready to uh, give a question first of all? Should we start in a, in a different order than than before? Peter, would you like to start? Is that that okay? Yes. Um, so my, my my question is, how much on a daily basis would that uh, enrich the the diet? Uh, so on the amount of the on the amount of the lutein or omega three that the consumer can get. Yeah. So so assuming that that every person eats one egg per day, mm -hmm. how how much on the daily basis would that um, improve the uh, the diet so for example uh the rich eggs had a higher lutein content which uh can improve the requirement for a vitamin a of uh the consumer as well and we observe this higher content of linolenic acid so both of these compounds will improve the nutrition of the of the consumers because first it will uh, help them to meet their requirement of vitamin A and the omega-3 will help them as well to balance that omega-6 to omega-3 ratio in their nutrition and therefore obtain the health benefits such as reducing inflammation in our body. And then if, if I have one more ask, uh, question, um, what areas are vitamin A deficit? What areas? Uh, in geographical, in a geographical yes. term? Yes. It would be, um, for example, middle to low social, uh, income countries, for example, in which they have less accessibility to uh, foods that are rich in vitamin A. Um, for example, um, we have, um, so, so like, um, Toma like tomatoes, which are very uh, a good source of vitamin A, and as well some like carrots, for example, or uh, salmon as well, that can help them reach those uh, vitamin A requirements. So, so in, in other words, is that a method to improve the quality of lives of um, poor geographic areas? For the moment, it is a little bit uh, challenging because these methods, uh, specifically the rich eggs, are present on a higher price. But the cost production, for example, of this uh, and the enrichment of these uh, eggs doesn't require such a high investment. So it would be uh, mostly a cost and scalability uh, term in which there, in which this enriched eggs could reach that price of the of the non enriched eggs so there is a challenge here but um, that would be mostly based on the market dynamics that that uh, uh, in which the eggs are commercialized now i see a question from the the audience here i think you've already answered it though that um, how would you recommend consumers to prepare their eggs to get as much health benefits as possible i think you've already mentioned the tomatoes and and salmon that you could mix in with the eggs i think is that does that actually answer that question what you've already said yes that's a an excellent question because there is not a best way to prepare the eggs uh, as you can see for example boiling gives uh, for brown shell eggs more peptides, which can be antioxidant, for example, or anti-inflammatory. And we have for white shell eggs, in which boiling gives more of this linolenic and docosahexaenoic fatty acid. So it would be depending on the health benefit the consumer would like to get, if we would like to get like anti-inflammatory or more vitamin A, for example, or in that case, more omega-3, they will need to tweak and uh, the preparation method to obtain these bioactive compounds. Okay, thank you. Um, any of the other judges like to come in with any more questions at this time? I, I would like to ask one question, um, Joe Shirelli. Emerson, I think you did a great job in presenting as well. Um, and I am a layman when it comes to understanding the nutrition of eggs. That said, when you talk about the enrichment of the egg, how do you quantify how, I guess, how to enrich the egg through dietary supplementation. Can you determine ahead of time how much more polyunsaturated fatty acid is going to be generated in the egg, um, how much more protein is going to be generated in the egg through the dietary supplementation? 
that's my question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, there is not a clear way to determine beforehand how much it will be enriched in these compounds. It depends very much on the source of the compound. For example, we have uh, observed that, or previous studies have shown that using, for example, omega uh, fish oil enriched more DX with this docosahexaenoic fatty acid compared to other sources such as uh, flaxseed, for example. So you can only determine the enrichment level after the uh, hen has laid the egg and therefore analyzing the content in that egg. But yes, the source of the compound does play a role on how much the compound is enriched. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, any thank other you. points uh, people would like to make? If there is time, I, I just want to uh, th thank you for thank you for this this presentation. It was excellent. Uh, to be honest, now I'm confused. If I go to buy uh, eggs, which one do I want? So peptides or digestion or DJ or uh, but this really but this really clears up. Um, I have a quick question. W what are the next steps? I mean, now that you see your research uh, going and, and you you identified some differences, very bioactive differences. So what's next? Yes, thank you for your question. So next, uh, studies will um, evaluate the physiological relevance of these bioactic compounds. For example, we know that they are bioaccessible now. Now, can they be absorbed? And if they have an effect on, for example, inflammation or hypertension, for example. So next steps will be like uh, evaluating the absorption of these compounds and also looking into their anti-inflammatory activity on cells, on cell culture. And after that, if we see a good effect on the cell culture, and if we see that they're absorbed, then we'll proceed with in vivo studies using animal models to see if they can reduce the progression, for example, of atheros atherosclerosis. Thank you very much. So we, it's, it's time to move on to the, uh, to the next presenter. I heard there was a, a, a short question in the, in the chat that um, we missed, but um, hopefully the, I think the Our next presenter is Bikram Upadhyaya, a graduate student at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. His presentation is on the composition and biological properties of soluble post-gastrointestinal digestion fractions of common dry edible beans. Thank you, um, Bikram. Okay. Uh, first off, thank you, everyone. Um, my name is Bikram Apadhyaya, and I'm a PhD candidate at, uh, in Nutrition and Health Science uh, at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And today I'm going to answer some of the most asked questions on the internet about dry edible beans, or for that matter, if I go to any conference or talk, people generally ask which beans are the best. And I'm, I'll try to answer that question by sharing some of my findings, and hopefully at the end, you'll be able to make an informed decision about dry edible bean choices. So let's begin. So I'd like to start with the simple question. Do you know how many of us are obese? So roughly 70% of US adults are obese. And as you probably know by that, right? So obesity cause a different metabolic condition or health issues and diabetes is one of them. So in 2019, there were 463 million people living with diabetes, and that number is set to hit 700 million by 2045. And it's just not the health issue. Uh, in 2017, US reported $327 billion in diabetes-related health um, issues or expenses. 
So it's easier said than done, but like a healthy diet, regular exercise, and other uh, dietary changes can help you minimize some of these health issues. And speaking of a healthy diet, uh, U.S. dietary recommendation um, uh, recommends eating at least three cups of uh, dry edible beans, which includes uh, peas and other things. Uh, but then more importantly, USDA has uh, included uh, dry edible beans in both vegetables and protein group, as you probably know, because these uh, dry edible beans are uh, provides a good source of fibers and minerals and also the bioactive peptides. And so the, the biggest question, which beans are the best? So if, I mean, general people may just ask Google uh, or AI for that matter to come up with a solution, but they might end up with even more questions that they initially had. And because the best is not a very uh, good, uh, I mean, easy answer, it's uh, more subjective. So the thing that we all can agree is the bioactive peptide that are coming from dry, dry edible beans. So bioactive peptides are normally found in, in, in the natural form in dry edible beans, but most of it gets um, released when it goes through GI digestion or food processing. So we were, so that was our prime objective when we designed this experiment. Uh, so first off, we selected uh, three different beans based on the popularity and the availability. And then we subjected them to simulated GI digestion. And then at the end, those uh, GI digester fractions were analyzed for uh, biological activities in an in vitro cell model. And also uh, we analyzed them for free uh, amino acids, peptides, and phenolic content. So uh, let's talk about what did we find. So we saw that the black bean had significantly higher rate of digestion in both gastric and uh, intestinal phase, which suggests uh, it has a different protein structure and for that matter, different proteolysis pattern. Uh, higher rate of digestion doesn't necessarily mean more peptide content, and that's what we found out in the peptide content analysis. However, uh, there was significant uh, variation in dipeptide and tripeptide distribution. And we anal uh, use a DCFSDA staining technique to evaluate the uh, antioxidant ability of this fraction. And from this result, uh, what we found out that the black bean was the most effective at lowering AAPH-induced oxidative stress. And for uh, the anti-inflammatory acids, uh, we used the TNF-alpha induction technique. And then we saw that all beans uh, ameliorated TNF-alpha signaling over DMSO control. So now the question is even more complicated and to help understand that effect, uh, we did the uh, peptide characterization. So this heat map shows the distribution of all di and tripeptide, and then try to simplify this uh, histogram or heat map into um, a different model. So we came up with, uh, we found out this uh, antioxidant predictor model, which uh, shows that the uh, black bean had relatively lower antioxidant properties than Great Northern Bean and Pinto Bean. However, we looked at the uh, free amino acid analysis and then saw that black bean and Pinto Bean were relatively higher in most amino acids, in including the alkaline amino acid, which are a known antioxidant. Um, and we also did a phenolic content analysis, and we found out that the black bean and pinto beans are proportionally richer in flavonol and especially hydroxybenzoic acid derivative. So what we can tell is, um, is that the, the conclusion, what we can make from here is black bean and pinto beans are both uh, rich in both amino acid and polyphenol. However, black bean had a higher rate of digestion and exhibited the highest antioxidant activity. So to summarize and go for the long-term goal, I would like to see a uh, develop a bean-based functional food by analyzing uh, different bioactive peptides and characterizing all the uh, polyphenols and then um, um, fibers, et cetera. And also the more important thing is to understand the synergistic effect of peptide, dietary fiber, phytochemicals, and gut microbiome. So with that, uh, Thank you so much.
Thank you, Vikram. That was uh, very interesting. Of course, uh, bean uh, and, and other kinds of legumes either uh, have been increasingly important in, in nutrition today, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so it's time for the judges' feedback and questions. Um, I don't know who that would. Would you like to start this time, Renat? Yes, Renat, would you, have you got a, or does someone else like to volunteer to start? I can start, but Ignacio. Okay, yeah, yeah. Hi, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if Ignacio, if you want to start because you okay. didn't go last uh, time. I can start. Uh, oh, thank okay. you. Sorry. No, it's okay. Thank you for your presentation. It was excellent, also. Um, what What can you tell me about the anti uh factors of of the beans? Yeah, Did that's uh, yeah. Sorry, that's no, a okay. Really okay. Go ahead, well. Yeah, and that's one of the critical when we talk about dry edible beans because most of the people why people don't consume dry edible beans is because of they may have heard about anti nutritional factor or indigestibility, bloating, gassing, all kinds of things that will pop up. But um, and then one of the key thing is how you prepare beans is one of the critical thing. So in our research, uh, we use a traditional. Uh, method of preparing bean, like uh, soaking and then cooking. And then soaking is one of the uh, best technique to leach out all those anti-nutritional factors and fight it is one of them. So uh, what we found out that the uh, soaking is really important and then cooking and soaking, again, it leaches out those anti-nutritional nutritional factor and cooking will actually make it uh, more uh, easier for enzymatic digestion down the road. And that will minimize the indigestion and bloating. So it's a combination of things. Uh, but yeah, uh, I think uh, soaking is one of the critical thing in preparing beans. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. I have a quick question. Okay, uh, wait, carry on, let's carry on. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. This was a great presentation, and mm -hmm. and as a dietitian, it always it that right. that's the question that we are being asked. Okay, which one should I should I choose? So mm -hmm. thank you for that. And and you may refer to it, and I missed. But with respect to the protein quality, think about PDCAS. It, did you see any differences between the different beans that that you that you uh, investigated? Um, yeah, that's a thank you from the dietary perspective. So in terms of protein quality, I think uh, there is no deny that the protein quality is almost similar in all these bean varieties. The only difference is how uh, they are distributed and what are the abundance of different dye and tripeptide. And it gets even more complicated when we try to investigate all this uh, because uh, like we saw high abundance of dipeptide in great northern bean, and then high abundance of tripeptide in black bean. And then based on that antioxidant prediction model, it was all over the place. The, there is no clear answer which one is better. But what we can tell is um, because every peptide sequence has their receptor and then down uh, downstream pathway. So I think in terms of quality, uh, I wouldn't say, or I haven't found a clear answer which protein is different, but I think the, the, the effect we are seeing is a synergistic effect. And I think, I know it's a really complex thing to say, uh, but since we are looking at uh, free amino acid, uh, phenol, phenolic content and peptide, I think they're all playing a role in synergistic way to get that uh, effect. So it's really hard to say it's just because of the protein. And yeah, that would be unfair to say, okay, this bean is good in protein, so you should take this. Because now we also have to include other factors like polyphenol, resistant e star. So yeah, sorry, I didn't have a clear answer, but- uh, You answer, thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, can I just to chip in a, a question from the chat here? Um, first of all, someone's saying, sounds like three bean soup is a good choice. I spoke to you agree with that, but th this is perhaps a more testing question. Uh, mm -hmm. says, and I'm not quite sure I understand it myself, why was DMSO used as a control? Is DMSO not toxic to cells in general? I've asked you uh, that fairly briefly, so we can uh, still got a chance to take another question from the judges. Okay. Um, should I answer that question about DMSO? Yeah. Okay. DMSO, I think that's probably a, a fairly important question. 
Yes, uh, so uh, I don't know uh, how familiar the uh, person who is asking this question, but DMSO is a fairly uh, universal solvent for any uh, compound that we use for cell culture study. As long as we maintain that 0.1% limit in the media, it's not considered toxic. And since I had a reference compound like quercetin for antioxidant assay and then curcumin for anti-inflammatory assay, so I use that uh, DMSO as a solvent, as a vehicle. So I wouldn't say it's toxic. So what, what does that stand for? Uh, it's a, a dimethyl sulfoxide, uh, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, it, 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 it sounds, it doesn't sound like you want to drink it, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, okay, th thanks for clearing that up. Mm -hmm. uh, Joe uh, and Peter, do you have any further comments? I do not, but DMSO is actually a horse liniment. <laughs> it's a horse liniment. It's used to rub down horses. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, that's, um, uh, I don't know much about that either. So, um, <laughs> oh, I think we will. Uh, th thanks very much, um, Big Crown. I, I think it must be. Um, I don't see any other points in the, uh, in the chat. So uh, we'll, we'll move on to the next presenter, please. Hello again. Our final presenter is um, Arda Tohayoglu again, who is, uh, as we've heard before, a graduate student at the University of Arkansas in the Department of Food Science. He will present a green integrated approach to extract high value wax and bioactive compounds from sorghum bran via supercritical carbon dioxide. Thank you very much. Hello again. And here I am again with another supercritical carbon dioxide study, of course, but this time the objective is uh, developing a green integrated approach to enhance the utilization of green sorghum in foods. So I would like to start with the question, a simple question that I get all the time, which is, what is even sorghum? So sorghum is not well recognized, often overlooked, but definitely an underutilized cereal. And the reason is sorghum has some sensory defects, such as it has an earthy aroma and an astringent mouthfeel. It may not be the most appealing or appetizing grain out there, but it is extremely resistant to drought. It is native to sub-Saharan region of Africa. It is climate friendly, it is gluten-free, and it's rich in high value polar and non-polar compounds. Well, the the high, polar, uh, high value polar and non-polar compounds are specifically located at the outermost layer of the uh, sorghum kernel, which is sorghum bran. And the problem here is, although the interest in sorghum kernel is rising due to the severe effect of global warming and uh, the rising trends of gluten-free diets, the coating layer, the sorghum bran, is discarded as waste. However, we are losing unique compounds by wasting such valuable raw material. Here is the black sorghum brand, what black sorghum brand looks like after decortication. It has non-polar compounds in it, triacylglycerols, free fatty acids, phytosterols, polycosinols, simply lipids, and the polar compounds that are phenolic acids, flavonoids, and anthocyanins. Those are just fancy ways of saying food colorings and strong antioxidants. And the current solution to recover these compounds would be petroleum-based organic solvent extractions. For lipid compounds, hexane is the best in terms of efficiency and uh, the polar compounds, methanol works the best, but no need to say they are, they are not climate friendly at all and they are neurotoxic. So we propose a ethanol water modified supercritical system to extract both fractions in a single run. So this is the process schematic diagram. This is the representation of the extracted we have in our lab, I'm assuming now we are all experts on how CO2, what CO2, supercritical CO2 is. Now I want to show you how simply how it works. You start with, uh, we have a high pressure vessel here. You start with inserting the bran in the vessel. And then we have a supercritical, uh, we have a, a carbon dioxide cylinder, which is in liquid form as the solvent source. 
and we adjust the pressure by high pressure pump with the uh, with the help of an air compressor and then the temp the temperature in heating chamber is set and controlled by a temperature controlling unit to keep the carbon dioxide uh, at that supercritical region throughout the processings and then everything goes by itself, wax rich lipid is collected in the vial, exactly as shown here. And please notice that we are not dealing with any solvent removal here, because the carbon dioxide, as the carbon dioxide leaves the chamber, it immediately decompresses and flows away, since CO2 is, the, is, ga is at gas form at the room temperature uh, by its nature. So, we are only left with what we need without solvent residues. However, we are not done yet. We have another fraction to recover. This time, the cold solvent joins the system with an HPLC pump. And with the help of a cold solvent pump, we are pumping in water and ethanol to help carbon dioxide recover polar compounds better. And the bottom line, the phenolic rich, rich fraction is also collected in a separate vial. And throughout this process, we never turn off the system. We collect both lipids and phenolics sequentially, one by one. And this is how simple it is to operate with a supercritical CO2 extractor. Let's characterize those. The wax rich lipid fraction, this is the GC result. My GC results, we detected uh, free fatty acids as well as polycosinols and phytosterols, the lipids that I talked about. Here are the HPLC results, the polyphenols, the antioxidants, and my favorite part, uh, the natural food colorings, those are, these are called 3 deoxyanthocyanins These are rare natural colorings that are hugely abundant in sorghum. And that's all the compounds we promised to extract uh, without use of any toxic solvents. If you need to learn more about uh, the study, you can either uh, check out our publications on publication on that study, or you can Give me a visit in Colorado during poster sessions. Thank you so much for listening. Well, that was very interesting. Um, I know that uh, sorghum is quite a versatile crop, and in Africa, they're actually using it uh, for commercial beer making, not just like some local brew, but you know, you know proper proper beer that uh, large breweries are making. Uh, so we'll we'll move on to the um, questions and comments from judges. There are no questions from the audience in the chat at the moment. Um, uh, who, who any volunteer Ignacio you you would you like to go first okay uh, again Arda uh, thank you for your presentation it was very good um my question is um in in which foods could be incorporated uh, this uh, extracts and apart from that is the extracts provides apart from color some flavors to the foods or maybe what what the Okay. Thank you for the question. So flavor-wise, uh, we are not certified as food grade lab, so we are not allowed to taste. But I think the number one extraction, uh, the number one application on it, remember my previous, uh, during my previous presentation, I talked about the wax demands. So sorghum wax is different from uh, rice, wheat, and uh, corn waxes because it has a lot of polycosinols, long chain alcohols in it, which makes it a, a high, which gives a high melting point treat that can mimic carnauba wax. So I think the best, to me, one of the best outcomes of this research is to show that we can easily fractionate and collect these uh, waxes as uh, alongside with the other lipids without leaving any solvent residues. And of course, the food colorings that I showed, those are three deoxyanthocyanins. I think they are the future natural food colorings. Okay, thank you very much. That's very interesting, particularly about the food colorings. Um, Rinath, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? 
I just have a comment. I really like the fact that you are you using the waste and also uh, really in a, in a holistic approach, taking the benefits of both of the fractions. So congratulations. I don't have Thank any you. further questions. Thank you so much. Thanks for that. Uh, Joe, did you want to, to add anything there? Um, Arnad, I think you uh, did a fantastic job again. Uh, from my perspective, I understand that you're not food grade. Uh, however, in my view, in my past experiences, I've, I would see a lot of opportunity here in the cosmetic industry uh, with some of the uh, materials that you're able to extract here. Has there been any uh, discussion with anybody into looking into using these in the cosmetic industry for topical application? Well, with the cosmetic industry, the so uh, the the high melting point usually, as far as I know, favors the food applications, especially for candies uh, that that we that we get all the time. But with the cosmetic industry, so when I say when someone says cosmetic, it reminds me of some creamy textures that makes me think that sort uh, maybe wheat wax would be better option to sorghum but of course uh, i am not a cosmetic person so i don't know what they need but i believe that if for example we can as a follow up study i'm not we are not planning to do that now but for example as a as building up to this research the wax can be further fractionated to get a fractions with different melting points for specific uses okay thank you that's, that's interesting. Yeah, so, um, uh, Peter, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, you have yeah, to, uh, how much, how much um, benefits would that uh, provide to the farmer? How much um, value could he create besides just uh, producing sorghum? Um, how much value is so? If we increase the awareness of how sorghum can be useful for different industries that it'll eventually affect, it'll eventually encourage the farmers uh, to sow and, and cultivate more sorghum. That'll get you more benefits. For example, I live in Arkansas now. So, you know, 50% of the US uh, rice supply is coming from Arkansas, but uh, rice uh, demands a lot of water and we are running out of water because of that uh, environmental issues. So. The thing is, sorghum is getting popular and po popular, even uh, with the farmers and the scientists, because they are in need of an alternative. Because there's not, in the future, if we keep heating planet like this, we're not going to be able to cultivate as much rice as, as, uh, as we do now. And farmers are going to be, I, I don't want to say unemployed, but it is also challenging for farmers to. So if we show that sorghum can be useful in any way, shape or form, it'll eventually affect uh, farmers positively. So here, I think the point is uh, we need to encourage industry to invest more on sorghum so they demand more crops from the farmers. Thanks very much. Does anyone else want to come back with any uh, further questions on that? Ignacio. I have uh, one quick question. Um, the wax profile or the phenolic profile um, changed according to the different uh, extraction condition? It did. Actually, it did, but just a little bit. Uh, the profile remained more or less the same, but the intensity was a little bit different. We compared uh, our way to the regular way of extraction, which is uh, 80 percent methanol uh, sorry eight yes 80 percent methanol and we are around 70 to 80 percent of efficiency we cannot quite catch the methanol yet because it's the best solvent out there uh, for uh, the phenolics but uh, the I think it is still in terms of anti uh, sorry in terms of phenolic acids cumaric acid and ferulic acids are always the dominant uh, dominant phenolic class classes uh, irrespective of the extraction methods. Okay, thank you again. Thank you. Okay, well, thank, thanks. So if there's if there's no further questions, I don't see um, any any questions in the, in the chat. We're, we'll we'll move on to the next stage, which will be the um, deliberation of the judges, uh, and and that completes the presentations. Thank you very much.
Thank you. The scorekeeper will now begin to tally up the score from the judges and will also launch the audience poll. Now, this poll is only available on the annual meeting website. If you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, you'll need to move to the AOCS meeting website to vote. And the audience vote will determine the winner of the People's Choice Award, which is, as I said before, a cash prize of $50 for the, for the winner. So it's definitely worth voting if you've got um, someone you'd like to support. It'll only be open for, it'll be only open for a couple of minutes and we encourage you all to vote for your favorite pitch. Thank you. Very good. And we have the votes in and I'm pleased to announce that uh, the audience choice winner who will win a, 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 a prize of $50 is Emerson Nolasco. And he is from, where is he from? This is a good question. Um, I've lost his, lost, his de oh, he lost his details. University of Nebraska. No, no, the University of Nebraska. Uh, thank, thank you, thank you very much. And the the um, the second place is um, is Bikram Bikram Upadhyaya, and he will win a prize of a uh, hundred dollars. And our winner is um, Arda Tahoyoglu, who, who's for, for his first presentation, and he will thank win a prize. Much, he will win a prize of two hundred dollars, uh, free student membership. And um, uh, so, some some registration details you know, mentioned in various documents. So, uh, and the second place winner also wins uh, free student membership uh, for a year as well. So uh, that really concludes um, what what we have. I mean, I, I I found these all these presentations very interesting, and I I do thank the judges for making re really quite a difficult choice. I mean, I was a judge. For the processing division last year and I, I thought 
we had a fairly clear cut choice in the end and all the judges came out with the same agreement. But in this case, I thought it was a really, a really tough choice to make. They're all very relevant and all very interesting uh, presentations. So uh, thank, thank you to, to everyone for that. Uh, and, um, thank, uh, and, and thank, thank you to the AOCS for uh, allowing me to um, present to today. Thank you.